Good morning, Arcade Church, and welcome to our online service on Facebook Live or YouTube. Uh, if you want to make a comment on the comment bar, we would love to interact with you and get to know you better. Uh, that's, that's half the fun of doing it this way, as we get a chance to interact with each other during the service. I mean, how many times did your parents say, quit talking during church? But now we're encouraging you to do that, all right? So go ahead and make some comments in the comment bar. Greet one another, love one another. If you have any questions about the message, go ahead and, and put those in there too. I just wanna let you know kind of the direction we're going. Um, we started this last fall in the life of Christ thematically speaking, and we were going to intending to take that up through Easter, moving to the resurrection, and then COVID-19 happened, and the shelter in place happened, and the temptation was to stop and do something different because of the situation we were in, but I, I chose to continue only because what we are covering is as pertinent now as it ever has been before. And so last Sunday, we talked about the ascension of Jesus Christ. Next Sunday, we're going to talk about the return of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to give you the exact time and date of his return. No, not going to do that. Not going to do that. But we are going to talk about the return of Christ. And so what about this time in between? While we're waiting between the ascension of Christ and the return of Christ, what does this life look like? And that's what we're going to be talking about today. And I'm very excited about getting into this because I believe it will help us not just deal with the crisis at hand, but deal with the ones that we don't see that are coming yet. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love, your care, your truth, we're blown away by your grace and your mercy. And Father, we need extra doses of that today. I, Father, there is much anxiety, much worry, perhaps irritation and bitterness going on right now in our souls. And it's everything we can do to bury it, to keep it below the surface. And yet, Lord, you see us and you love us through it. So I pray that the truths that we look at today by the power of your spirit, will intersect with our lives and make us different. We pray these things in your son's holy and precious name, Jesus. Amen. Speaking of quarantine, how are you doing with this? I mean, it, when, when it first started, the novelty of it, the enthusiasm was building up and everyone was greeting one another. It's almost like Christmas season. Hey, we're all in the same boat. We're all dealing with the same issues. Isn't it great? We're doing this. Well, all of a sudden now, it's not that great. The irritation level is going up. The dissatisfaction level, the discontentment is going up. The, irrit the, the, the bitterness, the anxiety, the worry is going up. Zoom fatigue is going up. Everything seems to be amping up and we really don't know where everything is going to end. And there's intensity of temptation coming when you're working at home and there's no one there. And all of a sudden something comes on your screen. The food pantry is right there. What do you do when you're bored? You eat. And all of a sudden, a lot of the bad habits that we managed to bury during the week because of our jobs, because of our responsibilities, those are rising to the surface and they're causing us pain. They're causing us irritation and depression. What, what do we need then? We, what do we need? We need, do we need something? Well, yeah, we need techniques. That's what we need. We need, we need techniques. We need to work on something or, or this. We need, we need to insight. We need some insight to ponder these things. And I'm a big fan of techniques. I'm a, a big fan of insight, but, but here's the problem with those two things. They have a shelf life. They, they last for a certain period of time and then they don't. And so maybe what we need is not some new techniques on how to deal with COVID-19 quarantine in, in place, or maybe we don't need some more insight to encourage us to put a spring in our step for the next five minutes. But what we need, all of us, is power. We need power. We need power. And that is exactly what I want to talk about today, because it's power that every believer in Jesus Christ has. We looked at this last Sunday, but I want to touch on it again today. Look at Acts chapter one, verse eight. This is right before Jesus ascends to the father. And he's saying some things to his disciples because they don't want to see him go. 
but he's, he's going and, and they're beginning to see the end of his physical presence in sight. And so this is what Jesus says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Remember we talked about last Sunday when I said that the resurrection, the, the birth of Jesus, the death of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus are huge. They're like sticks of dynamite, but it's the ascension of Jesus that is the detonator. And that's what Jesus here is saying. He's saying, I'm about ready to detonate. I'm about ready to explode everything when it comes to my birth and my death and my resurrection. He hints about this a little bit earlier than this, the night that he's betrayed in John chapter 16. Look at this passage, verse seven. He tells the disciples this. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. It is to your advantage that I go away. It is, yeah, that's what he says. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, here's why it's an advantage. The helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. It's to your advantage, you guys, and it's to the cause of the kingdom that I go. Because if I don't, then my followers will be localized. Where is the bulk of Islam? It's in the Middle East. Where's the bulk of Buddhism? Where's the, the, bulk, uh, where's the bulk of Hinduism? It's in the Far East. It's in the Middle East. It, it's, it's regionally located there. Let me ask you this. Where is the influence of Christianity? Where is the influence of the gospel? It is global. There is almost no place on the earth where the gospel is not. Even in those places where it's forbidden. And that's what Jesus is talking about. It's best that I go because if I stay, my influence will be localized to right here. But if I go, it is like detonating the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ in such a way that it'll absolutely blow everybody away. And what he's talking about here, as far as the helper is concerned, he's talking about the Holy Spirit. And right there, that might be where I'm going to lose some of you because the Holy Spirit is the mysterious person of the triune Godhead. We believe that the Bible says there are three persons, one God, three persons, one God. We're able to identify with two members of the Godhead, the father and the son. We, we recognize I'm a father. I have a father. I kind of get the relationship. Uh, I have a son. I'm a son. And so I get that relationship, but the spirit, I, there's not a whole lot in human relationships that I can be able to compare to the spirit. And so sometimes the spirit is the silent member or the forgotten member of the Godhead merely because we, we don't really don't really know how to categorize that. And let's face it, Christians all over the world, they will, they will not argue about the father. Very few will argue about the son, but we all have our opinions about the spirit. And that just rebuffs us. It just causes us to pause and step back and say, you know what? I mean, we just get arguments about the spirit well, I want to share with you some things about the Holy Spirit that the Holy Spirit does, I think, that all Christians everywhere would agree with. And we're just going to go through those very quickly to get reacquainted with the Spirit because it could be that you know about the Father, you know about the Son, but when it comes to the Holy Spirit, I, I, don't, I don't know. I just know what I've been told. Well, let's look and see what the Word of God has to say about the role of the Holy Spirit. Number one, if you're taking notes... The Holy Spirit empowers. We looked at that last, last week when we're talking about uh, Acts chapter one, verse eight. And then we read this morning when you will receive power, that the Holy Spirit is bringing this power. We don't know what it is at this point, but he's bringing this power of the presence of Christ to the earth. And then number two, the Holy Spirit magnifies. The Holy Spirit magnifies. Look at John 14, John 14, 25 and 26. These things, Jesus is talking again. This is the night he's betrayed. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. He will magnify. He will take what I've said, guys. And he'll bring that to your mind. You can imagine 
The anxiety the disciples were experiencing when Jesus told them he was leaving. Wait a minute, I didn't take notes. I haven't prepared for the exam. How in the world, Jesus, are we going to remember everything that you ever taught us? Nobody wrote this stuff down. Nobody could record it. So how are we going to remember it? Jesus says, it's okay. It's all right. The helper, the Holy Spirit will come and bring to your mind everything. Well, what exactly will the Holy Spirit bring to mind? We see this in the same conversation that Jesus has in John 16. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority. But whatever he hears, he will speak and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. You see what what the Holy Spirit's doing here? The Holy Spirit's role is never to draw attention to himself. The Holy Spirit's role is to draw attention to Christ. It's like you're in a dark cave And somebody brings out a flashlight and turns the flashlight on because you're walking through this pitch black cave. I don't know of anybody that brings out the flashlight and and everybody looks and says, wow, look at that flashlight. Look how wonderful that flashlight is. And look at the light on it. It's really great. No, what you want to do is you want to find out what the flashlight is shining on. When you see a spotlight, You don't go to the spotlight. You want to see what the spotlight is shining on. That's what you want to see. The Holy Spirit's role is to act like that flashlight in dark place. It's to act like that spotlight is it doesn't want to draw attention to itself. It's meant to draw attention to Christ, to elevate Christ, to shed light on Christ, to magnify Christ. That's the role of the Holy Spirit. The role of the Holy Spirit is not to give you a second blessing. It's not to do anything experientially like that's not its role. Its role is to lift up the name of Christ and to magnify the beauty and the name of Christ. But then third, not only does the Holy Spirit empower or magnify, it also, the Holy Spirit indwells. I say it, I should say he. The Holy Spirit's a person. The Holy Spirit indwells, indwells us. Look at, uh, I could look at all kinds of passages, but we're just going to pick a couple out of 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Paul writes, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? We're we're talking the last few weeks about wrapping our mind around things. Wrap your mind about this. When God sent his spirit, he didn't just send the spirit to be alongside of us. He sent his spirit to be in us. One more passage out of 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? We tend to just absolutely abuse and misuse this passage. But the whole point that Paul is making is that your body, your physical body is the physical house where the Holy Spirit, the third member of the triune Godhead resides. Do you not know? that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God. You are not your own for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Why should I glorify God in my body? Because it's the housing place. It's the location of God's presence through his spirit. This, this is so significant to us. So significant because so many of, our, uh, of us in our Christian life, we live as if God is on the outside of us. And yet what he has promised to come inside of us and empower us. It's like this. Here's a couple of really simple images. Here's my favorite. I told you last Sunday, this is my favorite superhero, Spider-Man. And then here is Batman. All right. What's the difference between these two? Both are superheroes. One's with DC. The other one's with Marvel comics. Uh, But what's the difference between these two? Both are very powerful but what's the difference between the power to Batman? All of his power comes outside of him because of his gadgets It's because he's, he's tough and he's strong and he's built his body up, but all of his power is on the outside of him and it makes him strong. It makes him mighty. It makes him invincible. But then you look at Spider-Man and where does his power come from? It, It comes from inside. It comes from inside. And we all know the story. 
He got bit by a radioactive spider, which could happen. But his power is inside him. And it's simply expressing itself outwardly. Now, I know that that's not going to win. Neither one of these guys are going to win theologian of the year. But, but you get the idea that that's the difference between that the spirit is in you, believer, not outside of you, guiding you, but inside of you, guiding you, not outside of you, giving advice and wisdom, but inside of you, giving advice and wisdom is inside of you, empowering your life in ways that you and I can't even imagine that we can't even imagine. This is, I will say that this is what makes the difference between Buddhists those who follow Buddha, those who follow Muhammad, those who follow Moses. They follow the teachings of these great men. And the reason why they follow the teachings of these men is because they're dead. They're dead and gone. And so when a Buddhist says the teachings of Buddha resides in me, we get what that means that they've internalized the teachings of Buddha. The same with the Muhammad, the same with Moses, not so with Christianity. We don't say the teachings of Jesus live within us. We say the spirit of Christ lives within us. He indwells us. Now here's the problem. That's not our experience, especially during a time of pandemic we, we, our experience is that I, I wish I could feel that power. I wish I could experience that power. We hunger so desperately for that, that we, we move from experience to experience, from stadium to stadium, from teacher to teacher, because we get so ex- exercised. We get so excited about what's happening. We feel that that's the spirit's presence. And what happens so often for us is because we don't feel the spirit's presence, we're convinced that he really isn't in us. And so that means that we have to do something more. We have to believe more or we have to obey more. And each of us, it depends on where we are. If we've been believing more and we still don't, we still don't experience the spirit's presence. Well, that must be because we need to obey more. But if we are living in obedience, we're proud of our obedience and we're not experiencing the presence of the spirit. Well, it must be because we need to believe more. It's a faith problem. It's an obedience problem. I don't know about you, but I've lived my life long enough to know that I don't want to live that way. I, I, I don't, I don't want to live that way. And so this is why we're going to change directions here a little bit. And learn that how we can be able to live within that. So I'd like you to get your Bibles and turn to the book of Galatians. It's another letter that Paul wrote to Galatians and to the Galatian Christians. It was a region and Paul had gone there to plant churches and God bore incredible gospel fruit. Churches were planted and and lives were changed. But the problem was people came in after Paul. Paul's message was believe, 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 believe. And these people came in after Paul was gone and they said, now obey, obey, obey. Just to get an idea of the flow, look at chapter one, verse one. Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God, the father who raised him from the dead and all the brothers who are with me. Now, if you've ever read an epistle from Paul, you know that this is a unique beginning. Typically he would go in and talk about how much he loves the people, how much he's praying for them, how much he appreciates them. He even did that to the Corinthians in his first letter. And he's about ready to back the truck up on them. But but here he gets right to it. Imagine this. You're writing to someone and you're about ready to say some very confrontational, serious things. You don't say, Hey, dear so-and-so it's really great to talk to you. And just, I I just love you and just really enjoy reaching out to you. No, you say, Hey, dear so-and-so we got to talk. And so this is what's going on here. And that's what Paul's doing. He is just, he is very upset with the Galatian Christians. He's upset with them to the point where he is going to say some very difficult things to them. For example, look at verse six of the same chapter. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you into the, in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. And then he catches himself. Not that there's another one, but there are some who trouble you. 
and want to distort the gospel of Christ. These people were coming in and says, yes, the grace of Jesus Christ is wonderful. It is so great. And now that you've accepted the grace, the free gift of eternal life, now you've got to become Jewish. Now you have to get circumcised. Now you have to obey all 400 of the laws that we can't even manage to obey. That's what you've got to do. So you believe, now obey. And Paul is pitting the Galatians. He says, I'm blown away. I'm blown away that you would fall so quickly to deserting the one who has called you by his grace. He is is astonished by this. And notice his aggression. Let's skip over to chapter three, uh, verse one. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before, it was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. In other words, I told you what happened to him. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? You know what he's saying. You and I wrestle with this every day. If you've been a Christian for a while is we know that we have been saved by the gospel of Jesus Christ. There was nothing that we could do, nothing that we could do to earn God's favor. It has been given to us. Everything for us is done in Christ. And that salvation is a free gift. But what happens so often is we say, thank you for the gift, dear Jesus. I'll take it from here. And that's exactly what's happening to the Galatian Christians is that they have bought the false teaching that now you have to step in line. There are certain things that you have to obey. It's kind of the classic bait and switch. It's like a pyramid scheme business where you get in and then they tell you, now you got to do this. And Paul is saying, oh, you foolish Galatians. How, How can you let this happen? How can you let this happen to you? You've begun in the flesh. In your natural self, we came to Christ because of his grace. And now we think that we have to continue in Christ because of our works. And that's not the gospel. That's not good news at all for any of us. If you think that's what Christianity is, then I I don't blame you for rejecting it. I'd reject it too. But tucked in there, Paul says this in Galatians chapter 2. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Do you you see what he's doing here? He says that the Paul that persecuted Christians, the Paul that hated Jesus is dead. He's died. And the life that I'm now living is an expression of Christ in me through his spirit. That's not just Paul's story because he's super Christian. That's your story. That's my story. The the things that used to make the old Craig Hardinger, they are dead. And I'm grateful for that. And the people who know me the best are grateful for that. But there is this newness in my life and in yours, Christian, That is Christ. It's an expression of Christ. And so get this. When when you comfort people or when I comfort people, the truth is that's Jesus comforting them. When, When you refuse to yell at the person who yelled at you, that coworker, you refuse to do that. That is Jesus showing restraint. When you husbands, when you willingly sacrifice yourself for the sake of your wife in some endeavor, whatever that is, that is not you doing that. That is Christ in you doing that. Young people, when you obey your parents, even though you may not agree with what they've told you to do, you are obeying them. Why? Because that is Christ in you. That is the presence of Christ in your life. Now, how do we do this? All right, that that sounds great. I I like that, but how do we do it? Galatians chapter five, verse 16. We're getting there now, okay? But I say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. 
For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. The truth is there are things that I want to do that are of the flesh of my natural self. That is not an expression of who Jesus is. And when I do that, when I express the natural self of who I am by without Christ, then all of a sudden I'm in a contrarian against the spirit of Christ is what he's saying to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. In other words, the law no longer condemns you. It no longer is this hammer that comes down on you and says you are guilty of sin. If you live by the spirit, that spirit of Christ is in you saying to you, you have been declared not guilty in God's courtroom because of the work of Christ. Because that is what he has done for us. Well, all right. That, that sounds good. Walk by the spirit. I still don't get it. I, I don't understand what's going on here. And so I've got this super deep theological illustration for you. Okay. Um, an old youth pastor of mine used this many, many years ago. And for whatever reason, it stuck with me. And so I'm going to share it with you. Okay. Uh, I have here a glove. This is one of my gloves. And we all know that this is, this is, you could probably tell this is a work glove. All right. It's a work. We've got a hole in the finger. In fact, it's a work glove and it's designed to do many things. Now, if I put that work glove down there and I say, all right, work glove, work, do, do what you do, work glove, make sure that you do that. And it obviously it's not doing anything. Well, maybe, maybe it needs some encouragement, right? All right. So you say, okay, Hey, work glove, be who you can be. This is your best life now. This is going to be so great. And, 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 you, and you've got what it takes inside of you to do what you've got to do. Nothing. Well, maybe, maybe what it ta- needs is some training. And so, all right, let me show you what a work glove does. And so you pick up a shovel and you say, this is what a work glove does. It shovels dirt and it does all those things and it doesn't do anything. Well, maybe it needs commitment. You you need to rededicate your life. You need to, you, you need to re-up. You need to pray the prayer again. You need to do whatever it takes for you to be a work glove. You've got to do that. Nothing. You know what it needs. It needs fellowship. It needs more gloves. So here's a driving glove. Uh, um, here, here, here's, here's a snow glove and you just need, you need fellowship. You need other people with you. So here's a, a snow glove. Oh, oh, here, here's cross cultural ministry. Here's a mitten. And, and so here you can have the mitten there and, and then you can have community. It's a pretty silly illustration, isn't it? But we get the idea. The only way that this glove can do what it was meant to do is if my hand goes in it and then I work. And that glove is working, but it's the, my hand is what empowers the glove to work, to do what it's been called to do. That's the role of the spirit in our lives. When you and I try to live the Christian life in our own flesh, it causes nothing but dissatisfaction and discontentment. And when that sets in, we either try to obey more or we try to believe more. When in reality, all we need to do, all we need to do is recognize that the spirit of Christ is in us. So what does the spirit of Christ produce? This produces work. This produces warmth. This produces grip. So what does the spirit of Christ produce in us? Look at these verses here. Galatians chapter five, verse 22. By the way, this is a familiar passage to those of us who know our Bibles fairly well. But I would just say that every single person, if you, even if you're not a Christian, even if you're not a Christian and you're watching this, first of all, thank you. Thank you for taking the time to do that. That, is, that means a lot to us. But even though you may not believe in Jesus, I would say this, that every single person on the planet wants to be this way. Well, what is this way? But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. 
When we look at this wonderful list, I think that sometimes we make the mistake of thinking that these are commands. I need to go out and love. I need to be joyful. I need to be peaceful. I need to be patient. I need to be kind. Do this. Be good. Be faithful. Be gentle. Be self-controlled. And we've completely missed the whole point. It's like telling this, it's like telling this glove, work, work, produce, dig that hole for me. Pick up that shovel and dig that hole for me. Isn't this incredible? These incredible qualities that every one of us wants. And yet we can't produce in and of ourselves as hard as we try, we fail miserably. But the fruit is something a faithful God produces in you. Why? Because that's where the spirit of Jesus resides in you. And this is what he produces in all of us. Now you might be thinking, okay, all right, I got a Hardinger. I, I, I'm, I'm on board. What do I do? What, what, what needs to happen? Well, it, I think what needs to happen is a change of perspective. First of all, it's, we talked about this about a year or two ago. It's the difference between a rowboat and a sailboat. We've got a rowboat here and we all know what a rowboat is, is what's the, what's the power behind a rowboat? The rower. That's the one who's empowering. And some of us might be in really good shape. And so we could be able to row fairly well and for a long ways. And, but sooner or later, we're going to get tired and we're going to stop. And we'll just be at the mercy of whatever current we happen to be in. But a sailboat, even though it's very similar, it's drastically different. Because how does a sailboat go? It just catches the wind. It's, it hoists the sails and it catches the wind. And I think for many of us, we, we forget that the spirit of Christ empowers us. And so we live out our Christian lives, Bible study, Bible study. I've got to do this. I've got to do this. I've got to do this. And if I'm not doing this, I need to believe more. I need to believe more. I need to believe more. And yet what the Bible comes and says to us is the spirit who is described as wind is always moving. And so all we do is we simply hoist the sails and catch that wind. Now, does this mean that we stop efforting? We stop working? Well, no. We're, when, if you've ever been on a sailboat, there's always motion, but the motion is to catch the wind because we recognize the wind is what moves us forward. And do you realize the freedom in that? Do you see the difference between the freedom of this? Now, you and I might be like, love to be on a lake or on the ocean doing this for a little while, but then all of a sudden we're going to get super tired. But when we're here, we're in motion, we're moving, but it's different because we're moving because we've caught the wind and the wind is filling our sails and moving us along. It is a humongous difference of freedom. Let me, let me give you another image. I don't know how many of you watch American Idol. I confess, Debbie watches it. No, it, she and I, you, we used to watch years ago. We just kind of lost interest with it. But I don't know if you're aware of it, but hundreds of thousands of people enter into a singing contest and they get whittled down by a panel of judges to about 12. 12 people. And then once a week, these 12 people perform in, mil, in front of millions of Americans. And when those 12 people are formed, the judges are no longer judging. They hand the judging over to the American public and the American public, they vote for the one that they think is the best. And every single night, these contestants that perform on that stage, they have to be as close to perfect as possible. They have to be. One flaw, one missed lyric, one misstep, or looking at the camera the wrong way, and all of a sudden, America votes them out. Can you imagine the stress and the pressure of that? These are not professional performers. These are, these are carpenters. These are teachers. These are waiters. These are cooks. These are, these are uh, custodians. These are housewives and house husbands. And all. They're different kinds of occupations, and none of them are professional performers. And yet they're put on this stage where millions and millions of people do this or this once a week. And it's all based upon their performance except for the last night, the last night when the winner is announced, the balloons fall, 
the celebration goes, the confetti cannons are going off and they are just having a wonderful time because the winner is in all his or her glory and it's wonderful, but they've got one more task to do. They have to sing. They sing one more song to kind of crown them as the American idol. Now, let me ask you that this, are they feeling the same stress singing as the winner as opposed to when they were singing as a contestant? It's all the difference in the world. It could be the same song, same singer, but all of a sudden everything has changed because now they're no longer, they no longer have to garner the votes of the American public. They've won. They're in victory. And so now all of a sudden they are singing and it's not flawless. It's not the best performance. They might miss a lyric. They might miss a note, but it doesn't matter why, because they've won. They've won. What is it for the Christian? Is it, are we winners because we've managed to obey well or believe more? No, we, we have been declared victors because Christ is the victor. Christ is the winner and his spirit is living in us. And so now many of the same things that we do, read our Bibles, pray, serve, be generous, sacrifice. We do those not to garner the father's approval, but because we already have his approval. We've won and we're free. And the reason why we've won is because Christ has won. Do you see the difference in mentality? And so for you, Christian, you're looking at this time and you have been wasting your time and you feel awful about that and says, I need to believe more or I need to obey more. Can I just say this? Stop and recognize that the spirit of Christ is in you. Otherwise, you're just going to be a glove with no hand. All right. So we want these things in our life, the love, the joy, the peace, the patience. We want all of those calls in our life. And, and now we've learned that that's what produces real freedom that we need not perform for Christ anymore or for each other, because Jesus Christ has demonstrated his love for us in this Christ died for us. But if there's nothing to do, what do we do with nothing to do? Well, there's some things to do. And let me just list off some of those for you. Number one, I think get acquainted with the Holy Spirit. I know that you can go online and listen to all kinds of sermons on the Holy Spirit and you can get different opinions on the Holy Spirit. That's great. That's fine. But why not you open your Bible and see what God's word has to say in John 13 through 16, in Romans chapter eight, in Galatians chapter five. Those are good chunks of scripture that speak specifically about the role and the person of the Holy Spirit. You get to know him as God's word instructs you. I think that'd be very, very viable for you. Also, I, another invitation, join me on day and night. Day and night, if you don't know, is just a time where I meet with you every morning at 7 a.m. and every evening at 7 p.m., Monday through Saturday. And all it is is just, us hoisting the sail to catch the wind of God's spirit to lead us that day. So I encourage you to join me. And in the evening, sometimes uh, someone else from Arcade will lead you. But by and large, it's just a chance for us to begin the day and end the day, having sailed with Jesus and caught that wind and to enjoy the freedom that he has, even though we're going about the motions of our everyday lives. But then number three, include the Holy Spirit in your daily rhythm. I, I know that I encourage you and I would never apologize for that, but I encourage you to, to have thoughts of Christ throughout the day. Well, where do you think those thoughts come from? I guarantee you a person who does not have the spirit of Christ doesn't cast one thought towards Jesus for days on end because Christ is not in them. But for those of us who have professed our faith and confess that Jesus is Lord, those thoughts that we have about Jesus, that's evidence of Christ in you. That's evidence of his spirit. And so make the spirit a part of your everyday rhythm that you recognize, Lord, I know that your spirit and the wind of your spirit is blowing throughout my life. And so all I want to do is catch the sails of your freedom and live for you. And wherever it takes me, it will take me to Christ. It will take me there because that's where the spotlight of my life wants to shine is on Christ. But then fourth, be 
conscious of those present of the presence of critical moments in your life. Be conscious of those critical moments in your life. When you are by yourself and you're, you're working and all of a sudden a seductive ad comes up on your web browser. The temptation is huge to click and see where it takes you. Be aware that Christ is in you. The spirit of Christ is in you, loving you. When you want to yell at that coworker who yelled back at you. When you don't want to sacrifice for your, sp- for your spouse. When you don't want to encourage your neighbor or pray. When you don't want to do those things, you know that that's not the spirit of Christ speaking to you because the spirit of Christ is leading you towards Christ. So be aware of those critical moments in your life where you sense that other winds are blowing that are not taking you to Christ. So I know that we've covered a lot of ground about the spirit, but while we wait in between the ascension of Jesus and the return of Jesus, he has given us the detonator of his spirit. And we live out that life in power, trusting him that he produces in us, even during crises moments, what we've always wanted in Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for the truth of the gospel. Lord, I pray in my own life and in my heart, may I be conscious of hoisting the sail in my life and allowing the wind of your spirit to take me to the glory of Christ, to fellowship with Christ, to bearing fruit in the name of Christ. I pray that for every single person watching and listening, Lord. You allow us the presence and the knowledge of the presence of your spirit. Even now this morning, father, as we are in our homes with our families, with our loved ones, that we are conscious that your spirit resides in us. We praise you. We thank you in the holy name of Christ. Amen. Thanks for watching. Find out more about the Arcade Church community at arcadechurch.com.